The subjects then are delusion, poetry, and madness. No, excuse me, delusion, poetry, and truth. We can take that last part and put it under the subset of the first part. Delusion, poetry, and truth. And so these are the subjects. And so, well, how does, how does one start to consider that? And I think the advice seems to be the advice from the previous study and contemplation. The advice seems to be to begin with a mention of the work of a particular artist or maker or poet of language. And that would be one of the well-known modernists, the 20th century iconoclasts, the breakers of form into various forms of 20th century free verse, so emblematical, at least upon the page. But who I'm talking about specifically is Laura Riding. Laura Riding or Laura Riding Jackson or Laura Reichenstahl or Laura, Laura Gottschalk, I believe. But she goes by Laura Riding or Laura Riding Jackson. And um, one of the premier modernist poets who the, the arc of whose career, though, is specifically unique in a way that shows as time goes on, as time goes on in the way that we appreciate the um, poetry that has become our inheritance from the previous century, the 20th century, um, the poets that were the vanguard of modernity, the vanguard of modernity, so much that they gave, they gave this word modernity its characteristic form. The poets of the heaps of the ragged edges of civilization, the wasteland, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound's juxtapositional method of composition in the cantos, um, Gertrude Stein and her way of collecting, so to speak, collecting communities of people, expatriates in Paris, along with a gifted way, I suppose, of giving a party or having a symposium, as well as a gifted use of the form of the word. So much so, Gertrude Stein is who I'm talking about, where as a modernist, she gives to modernism its, its mantric, its mantric quality. Language is a mantra, as a mantra. In other words, what she said about the city across the bay to the east, about Oakland, where she was born and raised before she went to Paris and became a famous expatriate. What did she say about Oakland? There is no there, there. And we laugh because it seems like such a clever put down. And it is, and it's entertaining on that level, on that form. But it also has become monumental in our minds, in its, in its utter simplicity as an utterance. <clears throat> in its utter simplicity as an utterance, it has become monumental in our mind. It's a tautology, oh so fascinating, and yet it is not a tautology. There is no there there. It's um, a statement of meaning that comes up in such a way that when it disappears, it leaves behind no trace of itself as something that you can signpost in your mind in any conventional way. Or to take another example of a similar kind of thing, a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. Now, here Gertrude Stein steps into the tradition of artful use of language as a student by quoting Shakespeare, a rose by any other name is just as sweet, which is itself a deep, original, and profound statement on the nature of language. A rose by any other name is just as sweet. You take it in through your senses, the most refined being the sense of the sense of smell, which attunes you to the atmosphere, and you know the rose that way. And yet, at the same time, you speak of it as the rose. But if that word were changed 
and speech were changed, what is would still be, would still be true. The rose by any other name would still be what it is to you. So that's Shakespeare's saying of it. Shakespeare's injection, so to speak, or introduction into the cosmic human mind of, you know, this particular artful form of, of a metaphysical truth. And then you have his artful student, Gertrude Stein, who distills it even more <laughs> and says to us, a rose is 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 a rose. And you can take it as far as you need to, to understand the meaning. And then it can stay in your mind. It can stay in your mind as an echo. So what enabled this aspect of the iconoclastic characteristic, the iconoclastic push, the iconoclastic heave of literary modernism, so much a part of the 20th century and its subsequent forms are so much a part of it, even as they go on into our present 21st century. Um, <clears throat> Well, th th it's a certain style. Let's just put it, step back and just give it a, a general name and call it a certain kind of style. Style being another form of the instrument by which we impress ourselves upon a certain resistant medium to leave a trace, be it a trace that can trace the letters of the alphabet or an image or a a figure or any or anything such as that. Anyway, so you could just call it a style. But now, Laura Ridings, Laura Ridings' writings present to us an entire constellation, an entire series of constellations, and an entire arc, an entire arc, an entire course, course. And surely that is a more purer form of the word career, a course of a journey, the journey of a maker, the journey of a poet, the journey of one with a unique experience and skill of imaginative conception at play in the field of language, characteristically restricted to versification, but in a larger sense, must also include forms of rhetoric and everything involved in, in rhetoric as a style, but even more than that, as, as a writer or what? As a, an utterer, as a custodian, a custodian of an, of an inner meaning, a custodian of an inner meaning of words. So let's just say that about Laura writing for just a moment. I want to touch on some of her uh, earlier associations in the course of her arc her other associations with other um, primordial figures in literary modernism and in the history of poetry as a whole, because some of these are individuals of, of great originality. I want to touch on that, specifically her association with, with Robert Graves, the great creative and intuitive scholar, as well as the mad poet Robert Graves, her very significant association with him. I want to touch on that a little bit. But... Um, I also want to touch on a certain turning. We call verse verse because it includes turnings, right? Verse, a form that poetry can take. Verse means turning um, in a particular universe, right? Universe means one turning. And verse is the form of that turning. And that turning can include a journey through many, many mediums. And despite all the many, many mediums that that turning may travel through, the pattern of it is still one whole, one wholeness. And that is something that um, poets of all ages, not just the modernist ones or the proto-modernist ones or the pre-modernists or the post-modernists or the romanticists or the classicists or the what have you, all of them in one universe, in one turning, they are embodying their ultimate concern as the very subject matter of poetry. So 
that being said, yeah, I want to provide provide provision. I want to provide with with just an opening utterance of lower writings. Oh yes, because before I, I say, it's also an important fact of her poetry of in every form that it takes, that in midlife, in early midlife, she abandoned poetry, or so it would seem. She abandoned the the verse that had given her such a striking name of a certain type of renown by which, you know, she made a splash on the literary scene. And you could say, and it could be true, that that's the very reason that we remember her now. She became part of the canon, so to speak. She became accessible to us in the cultural forms known as the book um, through the, the form of, of the uh, instinctively original modernist poetry that she wrote upon the page. But at a certain point, the impulses, the inspiration, the guidance that she received from within her inmost self um, led her to turn, verse again, turn, to turn away from the turning, to turn away from verse, and to embark upon a literary expression no less profound, but of a different style, that of prose, that of, some would say, critical prose, philosophical prose, but I don't think that she would put it that way. She was very exacting and very um, vehement and very thorough and very fearless and bold in her um, definition of what her work was in the face of everything around her that might have influenced her. And for this reason, she is also a heroic figure. And you can see that in her writings, even, even severe, a kind of a certain kind of severe vehemence when she was defending what it was that she was doing as a literary form. Anyway, um, for her, what, what it was was she turned away from the window, <laughs> the house of language, the house of language, right? the dwelling of language, the dwelling place of the word that we speak of as poets or as philosophers or as living beings, as speaking beings, as thinking beings, as studying beings, as remembering beings, as questing and questioning beings. We are led again and again on our road of language to a house of words, to the dwelling place of our conception of language as a whole. And as a dwelling place, it is a structure. And as a structure, it has certain fixed and definable forms or, or features or characteristics. As a dwelling, as a house of being, language has windows. Language has doors. Language has foundations, floors and ceilings, and roof beams and all these things, and they're all fruitful metaphorical ground, but what I want to speak of specifically is the door and the window, or as it is said in an old fairy tale, speak to the door so that the window may hear. In other words, the language of indirect communication, because everything that you do, which is, means thinking and speaking, in consciousness, in the house of language, everything that you do in that house has something to do with every other element of the house because there is a structural principle that embodies it in its entirety. This is, this is like the myth of wholeness, right? The myth of the dream of wholeness that poets might seek after. Anyway, so for Laura writing, um, the gestation or the destiny or her daemon or her angel in the course of composition um, inspired her to turn away from that world of language glimpsed through the window, either from within to the outside world or from without, from the outer world to the inner world, through the window, um, not to make too much of it, but at a certain point, she began to wonder about the window, the eye of the wind, the wind's eye, and she began to turn from the window to the door, to the doorway, 
to the door. And what is the door? The door is a movable barrier that can be opened or closed. Knock and the door shall open, right? Close the door and you will accumulate what is within the house in a greater kind of atmospheric kind of energy, I would think. But the door, a movable barrier, there or not there, in other words, is also a way, a way through, a way in, a way out, a way between, a way to be both within and without. And so then, for her, you could put it metaphorically this way, um, the poetry was the appearance caught through the window, either looking out or looking in, but it's different from the door because it is the door that is used for the person, the you, the soul, the being, to go through, in or out, or to be neither in nor either out, all of which is made possible by a door, by a doorway, by a threshold. So, this caused her to turn away from the, the visual form of the poem on the page, three-verse modernist poems on the page, which, as part of her, her daemon, her career, the splash that she made was rather controversial in many ways. There were so many sensitive readers of poetry back then. It's unimaginable to me now. We can only idealize it as we study the history of our art form in our mind, what it was really like to have this kind of devoted attention paid, so much so that you could bank on the sincerity of those who championed your work or who detracted your work. And so for Laura writing, that this is part of her appeal, part of her style. It's controversial. It was either liked or not liked. It was either endorsed um, heartily, enthusiastically, or it was set aside. And you could use the tenets, the style of modernism, to do either thing for lower writing. You could set it aside as being too abstract or too vague or too devoid of images. It would, all these things were said, too philosophical. All these things were said, and she could answer them point by point with, with blistering kind of um, insight, of course, because I guess that's what you have to be if you're a legendary modernist poet. You've got to be strong in your sense of yourself, and she was that. And then there were those, though, also, who realized, oh, this is her gift. She is attending to the inner energies, the inner energies of the words, the meaning then of the words, the inner energies of the meaning of the words. And in that way, she is more wholly traditional and more wholly visionary and more wholly in touch with the essence of what poetry is because she is attending to the, the inner meanings of the words as the breadth and the energy and the motion of human consciousness moves through those words. So it's like a continuity. And, well, I was maybe going to introduce this later on, but maybe I should introduce it now. Uh, her awareness of the continuity of the analog. The analog is a form of meaning. The analog is a form of speech. The analog is a style of thought. The analogy. Analogy. And meaning through or within or across. In logi, you could say logos or law. The law within, you could say. The analogy. The law within. Or we could go to contemporary technological terms, and we could look for an insight into this primordial word analog in the world of technology, in the world of electronic broadcasting. And we would find that the analog is that which is of a continuality, of a continuous wave through many, many different mediums. And... Um, capable of being translated into other mediums and yet still maintaining a certain kind of continuity or wholeness of pattern despite the intermittences or the um, beginnings and the endings or the transitions of one medium to another. There is still this kind of continuity, this wavelength, right? The wavelength. 
you know, such a natural thing, the sea, the air, sound, the land, the waves within the words, the waves of meaning, the rolling waves of interpretation of the inner meanings of the words as they go through not only individual consciousnesses, but also cultures, the analog. Yes, and so, so her poetry, again and again, you could sense this in one way or another, had this quality. And what I would say is, it was just like this is, I think this is oftentimes how it is with certain forms of genius and inspiration. It's like a visitation. When it arrives, it arrives all at once. And it's just all there, whether you're ready for it or not. And then you remember of it as much as you can, or you respond to it as best you can, or you take note of it as thoroughly as you can, or you remember it with as much devotion as you can. And then you go on, and the growth of your work as a crafter of language is motivated by the desire to become worthy of the original visitation of the vision that came to you. And in that way, you carry on the analog or the wavelength through thick and thin, through obscurity and clarity, through even knowing it's there or not knowing it's there. And your, the techniques that you learn to make yourself worthy as a, craft, as a crafter of the visitation that you live in expectation of one day arriving again becomes the path that you take in life as a maker. Oh, but how traditional that is, how platonic, how idealistic. And yet, something about lower writing was appealing to people on that level, and it's a testimony to their own sense of taste. Among them was, was the great trickster and anthologist and poet and mythographer and scholar and <laughs> intuitioner, intuitive Robert Graves. So anyway, but so that being said, Let's, let's, let's sample some of these utterances um, for lower writing. Um, so, we haven't gone into delusion yet. Oh, but that awaits. <laughs> if it is not already present without us knowing it. And then, but the middle part, poetry, and then, of course, the third truth, right? Um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That's another set of three or Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? Delusion, poetry, and truth. I mean, anytime you want to talk about the evolution of spiritual forms through time, these um, sets of three mythical con concepts are provided for us by our culture. And so, um, so this part has to do with poetry. Um, delusion is the Father, Poetry is the sun. There's a way that that's true. We could put it this way. Delusion is Zeus. Poetry is Prometheus. We could put it that way. In which case, well, what would truth be? Well, to put it dramatically, maybe truth is fire. Maybe truth is combustion. Or maybe truth is inner transformation the inner transformation expressed outwardly as the mystery of fire, right? Something more primordial than that most primordial of elements, fire. You could, you could put it that way. Hmm. But for lower writing and for all of us, the, uh, those who worship shall worship in spirit and in truth. What could that mean? In the invisible way that it is what it is. You could say that at the risk of uttering a cliché, but everything becomes a cliché, right? Isn't it the fate of language in time, in time, to become a cliché? And is, aren't, are, are, aren't they clichés because they are not life-giving in the way that we need truth to be? So if we desire and need that truth be life-giving, we have to enter into it in the house, through the house, through the doorway of inspired speech, of language. And Laura Riding is an architect of such a house. Anyway, but let's hear from her in her own words, where she, she clarifies to us what poetry 
as she set out to practice it was for her. Here is what she says. Poetry. A transformation, a transformation through poetic apprehension of the spiritual function of language and the natural force of the life breath of the word animating human mind. The natural force of the life breath of the word animating human mind of ordinary human verbal intercourse into a spiritually expressive, a spiritually successful order of human existence. In other words, the transformation of existence by the transformative power of truthful language, you could say. But um, the key phrase at this moment, and this moment will turn into other moments at this turning of the verse, for me, the key phrase is the natural force of the life breath of the word animating human mind. The natural force of the life breath of the word animating human mind. So, you know what this corresponds to, actually? And maybe this is an entryway into our further subjects. But does this not correspond to the function of the judicial branch of the government in that set of three. Isn't that what it is? Um, isn't that a set of three, the executive, uh, the administrative, and the judicial? Um, a model of government? And I take, um, you know, I claim some degree of legitimacy for that analogy because is not Plato's poetic, one of his many poetic masterworks, is, is it not called the Republic? And is it not modeled upon a state, the functioning of a state or the setting up of a state? And I contend that it is not so much a, a political work. When he's talking about a republic, he's not talking about an actual political form, but he's speaking of it as an analog. The analogy of what he's trying to get at in terms of truth is what he expresses through his description of the functioning or a setting up of the ideal state. So that in mind, the administrative... That's doing the, um, the executive that's command, decision-making. But the judicial, this is where I think it's important, it's judgment, the faculty of judgment. And um, so it would seem there are so many forces at play here, but the faculty of judgment that is our inalienable, an, an, an inalienable feature of us in our existence as human beings. The faculty of judgment is um, continually subject to movable barriers and onslaughts of obstacles of our way toward our own inner understanding of, of the making of, of judgments, of moral judgments, of judgments of fact, of judgments of meaning, of judgments of, of various, you know, values, visible and invisible, sensory and intuitive. This faculty of judgment corresponds to the judicial branch. And so, in this kind of poetic d description of an ideal judicial branch, how does the judicial branch operate? It operates through successions of interpretation. It's, there, it's histories of theories of interpretations, interpretations of individual cases and situations, as well as interpretive philosophies. But again and again, we come back to the word interpretation in the area of, uh, of judgment, in the area of judicial evolution, in the area of the understanding of certain moral and inner qualities that we are presented with as part of, our, as part of the way we live and move in this world. And so, um, so for lower writing, then, the life breath animating the meaning of words, that is her wave, that is her analog, and it goes through vocabulary, through syntax, through diction, through rhetoric, through verse forms. It is a continuity, and not only is it a continuity for her, and this is what I venture to say, um, this is part of her or our conception of ourselves as poets, our makers. The same inspiration that leads us into the poem, leads us out of the poem, and then we go on from the poem, and then the poem remains there as a signpost or as a sight seen through a window, either within or without. 
seen through a window. That is the poem as poem, of the poem as temporal form, something seen through a window. But what about the other aspects of the house? of language? What about the doorway by which we go through and in and out, and at times are neither in nor out, and flow back and forth through the door? And so for her then, the door that uh, was hers to occupy and use and enter and exit and dwell upon the threshold of was the door of the the entire course of language itself as it goes into and out of poems, just like when she was writing formal individual atomized, atomized poems, her consciousness was what was leading her into the poem and out of the poem. And it was almost what gave part of her poems their energy or their appeal, you know, their relentless kind of appeal, the way that it struck certain sensitive readers was that she seemed to be it seemed to be like a record of her consciousness as it grappled with these, these really deep and inner concerns, which eventually um, brought her to the point where she left behind formal poetry and thereafter, and she lived a long time, devoted her writing self, her poetic strength as an imaginative maker to prose. Prose which was considerations and meditations upon, upon the meaning of poetry and the destiny, the ultimate destiny of language, and then upon what is it that makes truth known to us, the really deep truth of knowledge and of judgment. And in this way, this is what set her apart from literary modernism in a major way because she was presenting it like she was talking about truth and ooh this could be taboo if you're living in the you know perceptual continual strategy of constant doubt which is good that's good but as um one who made an appeal to the judgment of actual truth in words this was where I think she had to leave off from poetry as a formal thing and just follow her own muse into these longer prose writings, which did not have as much popular appeal, I suppose, at least in that particular time and place. Um, and yet, though they did not, they are so very influential. So it's almost as if the poems and yourself as a poet participating in the contemporary world are ways by which your influence is made known, but your grapplings with the ideas and your nurturing of the ideas as they take form within you and as you midwife them through all the partial conceptions of them that your consciousness provides you with, well, that's a different kind of analog. It's not the individual units or the individual digitalized forms of, of atomized poetic forms and the even more atomized and digitalized form of the poetic reputation, professional reputation or what have you, of an individual. But to step back from that, it's the um, ever ongoing evolution of a wave of meaning that is leading you in and out, not only of the, definition of the, the definitions of words, but of your understanding of your own thoughts to yourself and um, the ways that you conceive of all these different literary values. That being said, when she abandoned poetry, she did not Rambeau-like, she did not turn away from it altogether as a repudiation. No, she based her explications of all her, so much of her subsequent writings with constant references to the poems that she had written as if to carry into this new medium and this new conception of herself her constant ongoing analogic waves of consistent questing understanding of the concepts that she first dealt with when she was writing poems as poems. So let's share one of those poems because it's gorgeous writing. Um, and it's true. There is that in her, which is, could be described as abstract, 
Um, but I, I find it to be that much more clearer in fidelity to the idea. And so, so this, this poem prefigures um, her turning away from poetry as well as some of the concerns that she was working out within poetry and continue to work out, and which is ours to work out now, God willing. Anyway, so this is, this is a poem by Laura Riding. It is called, Come Words Away. Come words away. Come words away from mouths, away from tongues in mouths, and reckless hearts in tongues, and mouths in cautious heads. Come words away to where the meaning is not thickened, where the voices fretting substance, nor look of words is curious, as letters in books staring out, all that man ever thought strange, and laid to sleep on white, like the archaic manuscript of dreams at morning blacked on wonder. Come words away to miracle, more natural than written art. You are surely somewhat devils, but I know a way to soothe the whirl of you when speech blasphemes against the silent half of language. And laboring the blab of mouths, you tempt prolixity to ruin. It is to fly you home from where, like stealthy angels, you made off once on errands of uncertain mercy to tell with me a story here of utmost mercy never squandered. Our threadbare prayers for eloquence, the marveling on man by man, I know a way, unwild, will mercy and spread the largest news where never a folded ear dare make a deaf division of entirety. That fluent half a story chatters against this silence to which words come away now in an all-merciful despite of early silvered treason to the golden all of storying. We'll begin fully at the noisy end where mortal having tempered mercy to the shorn utterance of man-sense never more than savageries took they from your bounty book not out of stranger mouths, then, shall words unwind, but from the voice that haunted there, a dumb ghost haunting, birth prematurely anxious of death. Not ours, these mouths long-lipped to falsity and repetition, whose frenzy you mistook for loyal prophetic heat to be improved but in precision. Come words away. That was an alien vanity, a rash startling and a preening that from a truth's wakeful sleep parted when she within her first stirred story-wise, thinking what time it was or would be when voiced illumination spread. What time, what words, what she then. Come words away and tell with me a story here. Forgetting what's been said already, that hell of hasty mouths removes into a cancelled heaven of mercies by flight of words back to this plan, whose grace goes out in utmost rings to bounds of utmost storyhood. But never shall truth circle so till words prove language is. How words come away from far sound away, through stages of immensity small, centering the utter telling in truth's first soundlessness. Come words away, I am a conscience of you, not to be held unanswered past the perfect number of betrayal. It is a smarting passion 
by which I call, wherein the callings loathsome as memory of man flesh over fondled with words like over gentled hands, then come words away. Before lies claim the precedence of sin, and mouldered mouths write to, and mouldered mouths writhe to outspeak us. So there is so much in that poem, but I wanted to put it across as a single utterance because it exists in that way as well. And then do what I have done. Make yourself a student of it. <laughs> and the perplexity will, will be better at that point. But, but, but it's as good an introdu introduction as any because there is that... Hmm, she's talking about like a myth, a conceptual mythology, a conceptual mythology of the energy of meaning in the world. And again and again there are hints and indirect clues to some kind of like a counterforce operating in the world of form. Now, she's saying, come words, away, transmute yourself out of this concatenation of circumstance along this arc, along this invisible analog, which is only discovered by the making of the poem as a form. Come away words along this course, a calling beyond, right? How good! <laughs> but then, within the circumstances of that time and space, what else is she alluding to? Before she, she mentions writhing mouths that shall outspeak us? Well, what are these things that she could be talking about? Well, could this be the way we can begin to understand this other necessary word in our three-form kind of like departure point of delusion, poetry, and truth? Uh, what is the, the word window? The word window means wind's eye. Um, what is that great French word or that great obscure fun word that we sometimes love? Defenestrate, right? The defenestration of Prague, the religious uh, political struggle that gave rise to the uh, historical incident whose, um, you know, it's almost comical now, but that word defenestration, that's for, I don't know for how many of us, I wonder if we could take a survey. Which percentage of us learned the word defenestration from learning about the defenestration of Prague in the history of early modern Europe? Well, that's not a question that I can answer, but defenestrate, I'm talking about, it means window, fenestra is the word for window. It's also etymologically related to the word for for showing the latin word phenomena showing so in other words the window is for looking through either outwardly of course at the outer world or inwardly from the outside at the inner world this is what the window is for it is for looking but what is the word though it is the structure the opening for going through yourself that is the door so could we say then that the world of time and space is that which is in language, is that which is glimpsed to the window, through the window, where we look at the showings, where we look at the appearances, at the manifestations. But when we ourselves want to inhabit or leave the house of language, what we use is what is the opening that is made for it in the building of the structure itself from its origination, and that is the doorway. Or, I just want to throw out this, the word dervish means doorway. Also, one who precedes us, who spoke in scriptural terms with great metaphors, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, or I am the door, the door, no one comes out or in, but through me, I am the door, the door is what is saying this. And so the door is what allows you to leave behind that previous sense of form. Oh, yes. Anyway, but we're still, we're talking about now, for a moment, what we see through the window in the house of language. And what we see through the window in the house of language is the play of words, the play of words, the play of the meaning of words, the play of words, the play of the meanings of the words circulating in a world of power, a world of temporal and political power. And how is that power used or shaped for the benefit of those who have 
taken the forefront, the upper end of the stick, you know, the um, crucial part of the tug of war rope. Uh, how is that power shaped and accumulated and kept and used to increase one's position in society by uh, the energy of, of opportunism, you could say. The world of temporal power. What is the world of contemporaneity but a world where power is finite? Power of whatever form, material power, immaterial power, no matter, it is finite. And as such, it is desired by many, desired by all, perhaps, but there's only enough to go around for few. And this leads to that constant kind of back and forth play of the energy of power in the world and how power is accumulated and shaped and wielded is through the influences of the ideas and the influences of the words and those who understand this in that conditional in that operational, in that functional, in that calculating, in that limited kind of way, are so very often those who bear away the goods and the riches and the powers of the temporal world, i.e. the powerful, who use language, use the structure and the circulation of the meanings of the concepts in the society and bend it in a certain way to the structures that benefit their own quest which is oh so often only for more and more power. Yes. So which brings us to this word delusion. Delusion. Well, you know, one of the key etymological roots of this word, illusion, is play. Like ludent means play. Delusion. It means, you could say, to play falsely, to play falsely. Could that mean also to cheat? Could that mean also to enact a transformation or transmission, maybe that's a better word, or transition, of power without the other seeing it as such? Deceive, delude, to play falsely, delusion. So there is that aspect of it. It is at work, though, in the human psyche from within. Delusion. It seems to have two parts, if we're going to think of this word in the energy of its meaning as having something specific to say to us now. It seems to have two parts. There is the delusion, the falsity of that which is before you. The falsity of the appearance, the, um, that in the appearance which is only appearance, and not actuality, and yet is still part of the form of it that you see with your eyes or whatever. Um, there's that aspect of it. But as to be a delusion, it must be surrendered to somehow. It must move into the house of language, which is the house of the cognitive psyche, and take up residence there as an uninvited guest you could say, or perhaps as an invited guest, maybe people delude themselves for all kinds of reasons, and maybe they consciously do, but most of the time, the basic essence of it is not conscious. It's, so in that sense, you could say, it is an uninvited guest in the house of language. So, now that we've entered into the world of temporality, in the light of all these poetic themes, let's consider some of the like corollary images or metaphors that we can bring to bear upon our perplexity in the face of this. Um, come words with me away. Okay, you know what that is? As, as well as many things, that poem. It is a calling. It is a calling. Called. And so, you know, uh, the most literal thing that I do in my uh, philosophical activities is the most literal thing I do is I try to go into these etymologies, the histories of these words, to see the ways that the words and the parts of the words change through time and the ways that they are, that they are used 
and um, in order to get a sense of what those words are all about, because that sense is present all the time in all words anyway, working on us in our conscious minds, but also present to us in our unconsciousness, you could say, to use a psychological term, which has its purpose. There is that beneath us which we do not see, and yet supports us. We can say that that is our unconscious. And um, these things, these meanings of words and these images, constantly are operating in our unconscious minds as well as our conscious minds. And somehow, for some reason, we as citizens have become, perhaps as a whole, as a general term, mm, we have lapsed in our awareness of the connections between the conscious and the unconscious mind. So that there are these traps in the floor, these doorways that come, vertical doorways that open up and close in all these unexpected ways through which all these energies go back and forth and influence the conceptions that we have as we try to come to an understanding of this world as we go on. And this is how delusion works, you could say. Anyway, so I'm, I was talking about the word call, calling. Well, what I would like to say is, it's a, and I was talking about etymologies, and so I've gone on a little etymological tightrope here, um, and perhaps less tightrope-ish if I could recollect more of the specific linguistic terms by which I'm arriving at this kind of leaping off point of intuition. But I just want to offer a definition of God, partially bolstered by turning the pages of a book, making sense of the print on the pages in my mind, which comes out in the form that it's coming out now. And who knows what kind of sense it really makes, really makes, but I'm talking about God as who is called, that which is called, called God, who is called God, who is called. Um, for some reason, I'm reminded of the inscription that Jung, that um, you know, primordial figure of the unconscious study of the mind, Jung, Carl Jung, he built himself a tower, <laughs> a real tower with real stones. And over the doorway, he inscribed some words, probably in Latin, but the meaning of the words in our language is, was this, called or not, the God is there. Called or not, the God is there. And this is an explanation of the truth of, of the conscious and the unconscious mind. You could say, oh yeah, the conscious mind is what we consciously call to or refer to or try to remember or to understand. The unconscious mind is that which comes up to us, comes up through us, presents itself to us in all these ways that we never get used to and influences our judgments and our judicial fa fa faculty in a certain characteristic way which we can only begin to understand as we go through the course of our lives. This is our, the nature of ourselves as unknown psyches, as unknown psyches to ourselves. It's part of the ways we must understand ourselves if we want to come to an understanding of, of what mysteries that beckon us in our practice of, of our various art forms. Anyway, so sorry that I mentioned God, you know, called doorways, right? Passageways, that's what we're talking about. I mentioned the door itself as a movable barrier which then leads me to say that I must mention also the notion of obstacle. Obstacle. What are the obstacles to the fulfillment of, of that which we truly want to understand? Okay, that's where I have to bring in the ideas for dramatic purposes, for conceptual purposes, for purposes of understanding this tradition of thought, of the obstacles, the adversaries, those things that work against, those things that work against. Heck, how can you mention God in this dualistic, circumscribed world, circumscribed by dualism and time and circumstance? Of course, there's a lot of parallel roads of meaning all around, over and around and under this world that encircle it and impinge upon it and flow through it, more transcendental forms of communication and commerce. But in this world of time and space, of duality, there's a devil. Well, what does devil mean etymologically? Uh, it could mean a lot of things, but to throw against could be 
to throw against? What are the traditional other names of the devil, which we come to know as we go to the rivers in between the ancient languages and our own, right? The Greek and the Hebrew languages and the Coptic languages and the Aramaic languages and uh, all the proto-root languages of all the Semitic peoples. And then the long-legged terms of meaning coming from the Sanskrit and the completely unknown forms of language meaning coming from the voices in the air and the spirits of meaning who speak soundlessly. And uh, in Laura's poem, she had that soundless aspect as well, something to pay attention to. But anyway, um, so traditionally in, in those kind of words, um, the devil could be called the slanderer, could be called the whisperer, could be called in a judicial sense the accuser. Um, the word Satan, I think it means originally obstacle. So that in the most primordial biblical texts, uh, there's not Satan referred to as an individual. It's more like the Satans are the obstacles. So I think probably there was some storyteller who knowing the needs of the story and the needs of the audience to whom he was speaking, knowing that it needed to have some personification, some characterological vividness, this obstacle force to the formation of the human soul along its pathways of discerned righteousness. Uh, the storyteller decided to make the story be more palatable and entertaining and easier to remember and to understand and to follow and to tell, decided to make Satan into a character. And so Satan became a character, and a most interesting one, indeed, because those who worship God worship God in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth. That's fine and good, but that takes practice. That takes practice and the awaiting of the visitation, which your practice has endeavored to make you worthy of. But um, the devil, it's, it's a little bit different. The devil seems to know right from the start and to be able to convey that which is oh so vivid and oh so captivating and oh so engulfing and yet there's something missing about it all and what would that be could it be reality i don't know let's think about that and so also to introduce another characteristic person that we if we want to understand laura riding and her work we also have to understand robert graves the great and tricky and mischievous genius intuitive poet um, they were associated very much together in the um, early formative life of both of them. Yes, and it had fraught and dramatic romantic aspects as well. And maybe we'll go into that as, as an introduction to what that could be. Um, I want to read this poem to you with a most intriguing title by Robert Graves, an early associate of Laura Writing. The title of this poem is The Devil's Advice to Storytellers. The Devil's Advice to to storytellers and consider the ways that we've begun to speak, to speak of the devil. And um, let's consider him for a moment. Uh, if you're going to be working in the theater, the theater of the mind, there's this individual over in costume design. And if you really want to know how to wear that costume and take your place on the floorboards and present yourself in such a way to get the drama going, you better go and have a talk with him, Mr. Devil. You better listen to him, but watch out, because he doesn't tell you the truth all the time. He's very interesting. And yet, in another sense, you look away and you look back, and he's no longer there. And yet his influence seems to remain, or he exists as a memory in you. I don't know. And so, that's one way of looking at the devil. You could call him the principle of hyperbole itself, if you want to be really playful about it. But let's... Let's see what Robert Graves has to say about this. This poem is called The Devil's Advice to Storytellers. Lest men suspect your tale to be untrue, keep probability, some say, in view. But my advice to storytellers is weigh out no gross of probabilities, nor yet make diligent transcriptions of known instances of virtue, crime, or love to forge a picture that will pass for true, do conscientiously what liars do, born liars, 
not the lesser sort that raid the mouths of others for their stock in trade. Assemble, first of all, casual bits and scraps that may shake down into a world, perhaps. People this world, by chance, created so, with random persons whom you do not know. The tea shop sort, or travelers on a train, seen once, guessed idly at, not seen again. Let the erratic course they steer surprise their own and your own and your reader's eyes. Sigh, then, or frown, but leave, as in despair, motive and end and moral in the air. Nice contradiction between fact and fact will make the whole read human and exact. The Devil's Advice to Storytellers. Uh, one thing I want to highlight here. Uh, what was it now? Um, yes. People it with persons you do not know. That's the devil's advice to the storyteller. With the people that you don't know. Because it'll work. <laughs> it'll work. And that's what a story has to do. It has to work. So, people it with what you don't know. Oh, Maybe you should give Satan a character or a person or a name and make him be something in your play. Maybe it's like that. But um, the devil's advice to storytellers. But, but so, what, so then what's missing then? Okay, well, what you have been given is everything that you need to make a world, everything that you need to wield power in the world, everything that you need to trick people, everything that you need to be tricked. Can't have one without the other. Everything that you need to wield, hold, accumulate, use, power, justify power rather than justice. You have justification of that which you are doing. Why? Because you have peopled the world with what you don't know. And yet, the model of language that Laura Riding gives us is one in which Language is a house. You see through a window. You see a world circumscribed in time and place. You see actions and transactions and powers and dramas. You see through the window. But what about when you, when you yourself, want to go in? Or when you, you yourself, want to go out? Or when you, you yourself, want to be neither in nor out? Then there must be the doorway, the doorway, the threshold, the way, the truth, and the life. So, well, then, what, well, then, th so then, the devil's advice to the storyteller has to do with what you see through the window. But when it comes to the part about knowledge, right, because that's what you don't need to have when you assemble that world in the world of time and space. Knowledge of the people involved. Knowledge is the chiefest and most inmost essence of the questing human being as a language presence as a language presence in a field of language, in a field of words, which in and of themselves, ah, uh, do they exist? I mean, do they exist without our word-animating human analogic energy to travel through them and animate them and lift them up, so to speak, to make them appear and move in a way that reflects the world that is hitherto invisible and, until expressed through them, you know, that's, uh, that has to do with knowledge, right? So the knowledge principle, that is what is in most in individuals, and that is what is m most impelling, what is most desirous of being made known in the language of poetry, and yet, on another level, in terms of the making of something that will work in the circumscribed world of time and space, we don't need to have the knowledge. As a matter of fact, the knowledge is a hindrance. It will keep us back from taking what is most animated of the human puppets and dressing them up and presenting them and making the entertaining story. That's the devil's advice to the storyteller, to have the puppets. But what's the difference between the puppet that dances on the strings oh so well, oh so artfully, and the actual living, seeing, being individual? Only the door knows, right? Speak to the wall so that the door may hear. Speak to the density of matter in, in time and space 
so that the door may hear. And what is the door? It is an opening. It is a way through, a way to be neither in nor out, a way to be, to be beyond, a way to enter into, a way to pass back and forth, a threshold. Knowledge. Knowledge is the province of the doorway, this, this individual uh, knowledge. Okay, so that's good. The Devil's Advice to Storytellers by Robert Graves. But let's consider this corollary thing now. I dropped a little hint that early in their careers, um, Laura Riding and Robert Graves were deeply and romantically involved. Let me tell you some more gossip, <laughs> vivid stuff. The devil's advice to storytellers, right? You know, you don't know these people, but boy, they got some dramatic things happened for them. We're talking, uh, you know, early in their career. You know, Laura Riding, she was American. You know, she came over, uh, she was married to Louis Gottschalk, the history professor. She made a strong impression on the fugitive group, the Alan Tate, Robert Penn Warren, John Crow Ransom, who at that time, I think they were all professors at Vanderbilt, and they were putting out this uh, magazine called The Fugitive. And um, there's a lot you can say about all of that stuff, especially in related, related to the social history of America and certain standards of, of literary criticism and stuff. But... Um, they were the ones who discovered Laura writing. She, I think, had graduated from Cornell and sent them some poems and stuff. And so, and she was invited to be, you know, just really a part of them, but she decided to go to England. So in England, she fell in with Nancy Nicholson, an artist, and her new husband, Robert Graves, who himself um, survived deadly peril at the time of the First World War. He was a Royal Welsh Fusilier, and he left the service after that and, and was, um, you know, a deep and nascent and precocious and, and beginning to be beguiling kind of like creative personage. And, and so to, to make a, you know, a long and sensational story short, they had themselves kind of a menage a trois, a menage a trois, you know, and and lore writing, she was just, I guess what happens is in this legendary gossip, which may or may not be really true, but it's kind of a principle of interest. And after all, once you read the poem, The Devil's Advice to Storytellers, you have to take the devil's advice a little bit farther into the story. So yes, they had themselves a menage a trois, but it didn't work out. It's, you know, it, it ended very explosively when, during a heated argument in about 1929, and I think there were several romantic individuals involved. You know, they were lifestyle pioneers back when it was even before the 1960s, I suppose. You know, I guess that's a human thing. But anyway, Laura defenestrated. Yes, she jumped out the window from the fourth story and she landed with injuries. And um, Robert Graves... He followed her, but but Robert Graves, he went down one flight of stairs, so he only jumped out the third floor. <laughs> so when he landed, he didn't get hurt. Yeah. So what can you say? And so and but now but Laura, she broke her back and stuff, and she spent months in the hospital and, and endured you know rehabilitation and all that stuff, and and she lived, of course, she lived to be a good long life and everything. But it was that at that point, um, after she recovered, that was during the time that Robert Graves wrote that autobiographical memoir of his war experiences called Goodbye to All That. Some say because he needed to make funds now because Laura demanded it for her rehabilitation. Yeah, there was a reputation going along now of, of just these intensely charismatic personages getting involved with each other in these interesting and destructive ways. I don't know. But at any rate, from there, Laura and Robert, they left the menage a trois, them two, and they went to Spain, they had to flee from Spain at the time of the Spanish Civil War. They spent time in Majorca, which is where Robert Graves eventually went back to live the rest of his life in Majorca. And they collaborated on a great many very creative literary works. Not only did they influence each other's poetry, but they also made mutually made these um, anthologies, very influential anthologies. Um, they're the ones whose analysis, Laura and Robert Graves, their analysis together of Shakespeare's 129th sonnet in the way that they said that it's a structure of integration and coordination upon a complex subject. So that inspired 
those 1950s critics, you know, William Empson, who wrote Seven Types of Ambiguity, one of the greatest literary titles I've ever heard of, as well as Cleanth Brooks, who took the title of his creative work of literary criticism, The Well-Wrought Urn, from a line of Keats. In other words, they inspired a line of criticism, one which the Beats rebelled against because it was considered to be, you know, overly formalistic. But we can reassess all that stuff now as as should be and as, and as has always been. But it was Laura Riding and Robert Graves whose critical judgments about the nature of poetry were so very influential in these ways, very creative. But at the same time, so they, they stood together for about 14 years and then, you know, uh, their relationship ended and Robert Graves stayed in Majorca and went on to all these other legendary exploits and romances and works of art works of literature, one of which, so protean, the white goddess, a historical grammar of poetic myth, a completely crazy book and very fascinating, one which is known to be something that he, in a large measure, cribbed, or, you know, another word for poet is thief, right? Uh, Laura Riding had a lost manuscript about some proto- uh, heroic uh, figure out of the ancient matriarchal kind of traditional religions. And she, when she left Majorca, told him that he needed to destroy that manuscript, but he did not, supposedly, the legend goes. But from it, he fashioned this inspiring and kooky um, compendium of uh, poetic myth, this grammar of poetic myths involving all these anthropological and mythopoeic cycles. Um, the White Goddess, which is a worthy subject of study in its own way. But um, supposedly, he took a lot of that from her originating work. And um, as I have said, she was fierce in her denunciations of certain things, so she could write some really thorough and really clear kind of uh, critiques of that work, but none of which make it any less interesting. And I think that she would admit that also. But anyway, so, so uh, the devil's advice to storytellers. So, here is a poem from Laura writing, which is The Devil is Friend. The Devil is Friend. I wonder if these two poems were written as uh, contemporaries of each other as, or as replies to each other. I do not know, but this is Laura writing, The Devil is Friend. Too late for peace. Your peace is ever late. And farewell, and alas, outrageous Blarney man, who hated falsehood better than truth loved. Goodbye and never greeting. See how his antics multiply to this fresh ancient theme. Ours is the endless judgment today, his the corrupt new endless years. Now you could read this poem and see this as a dialogue between two masks in an entertaining tragicomedy of devious romance. You could see it that way. And it, it works that way. It keeps us reading. But you could also look at it as her statement, very pivotal, very pivotal about uh, this other principle that her literary discoveries were making her aware of. And now that being said, we haven't gotten to the word truth yet. And so let me put it maybe for this way. Before I read this poem again, I think I shall, I think I shall read it again. But um, uh, for, for Laura writing, um, the truth, what did she say once in response to Keats's dictum that truth and beauty were one? Somewhere she says, uh, beauty, and beauty is truth and truth is beauty for one time only. And now I wonder if that means at the point in the formal poem where these two, you know, concepts kind of touch and from their union generate a new form, a literary form, that form being called a poem, but only for that moment. But what about the analogy? What led you there and what leads you out of there? What about that? How do you address that? And so for Laura writing then, the quest for truth had to do with that long view that larger analogy which takes you in and out of whatever literary forms uh, that you are studying. 
And so then for her, then truth would be, let's bring in this concept of revelation. And, I'll, and then there's one more thing I want to read to you, and then I know that the time is probably doing something with us, but revelation. Truth is revelation. Now, oh yeah, truth is revelation. Um, normally that's reserved for the, for the religious side of things. But as Laura wrote herself, um, poetry serves this analogous function to religion. And actually, let me paraphrase that for her, for us. Um, in religion, these matters of, of spirit, spirituality and truth and beauty and the soul, they are the thought, religious thought, thought being that by which we make things appear to us. And religions are thoughts, just as songs are, just as poems are. But religion then in that sense, that by which thoughts appear to us, thoughts of spirit and matter and beauty and mercy and pity and peace, these things are presented to us in, in these kind of formal and ceremonial and symbolic ways, as well as these, you know, intellectually conceptual ways, be they dogma or theology or teaching, you know, or any of those things. Whereas for her, poetry, um, she speaks of it as a, um, as a secular thing, but it's, it's, it's actually also kind of an, an otherworldly kind of um, secular kind of discipline. I wonder if I wrote it down in here where she talks about that. Um, thought, I thought I did. No, I guess I didn't. Oh, or maybe I did. Um, well, let me just put it this way. For her, um, rather than the formal, it's a question of style. It's a question of form. Religion is a form. Religion is a style, a way of presenting thoughts to the mind. Poetry is that where for her, the spiritual principle is what is discovered by the poet, what is revealed in the course of the poet's work as to the inner nature of the meaning of words. So the revelation that she sought, the revelation which for her is truth, um, is that which is created by the discoverer in the act of discovering. We say revelation to mean an unveiling or a seeing, but if it is something that we only see as something that is there and true, then it's just a fact. And, you know, facts are just always there anyway. They don't need us to be true. They're true without us. But there is something else that does need us to be true. And that is the revelations of the Spirit whose workings take place within the form of poetry as poetry goes through its changes in, its, in the arc of the lives of its practitioners. So I think that's a pretty good explanation. Um, okay, good. So uh, I'm not going to read The Devil's Friend again. Or maybe I will, maybe I won't. But here's something that I will read. This is a prose recollection of her about her defenestration. So here's what she wrote about that. Standing in that room was a quick result. I left that room by the window, of course, and poems came with me. Or rather... I went with poems. I hope you will understand about poems. They are why I am telling this. Because as life, it reads all wrong. But as poems, all right. Okay? Let's read it again. Standing in that room was a quick result. I left that room by the window, of course, and poems came with me. Or rather, I went with poems. I hope you will understand about poems. They are why I am telling you this. Because as life, it reads all wrong. But as poems, all right. So what the devil excludes, knowledge, the inner knowledge of the character, for her, the poems came with her, or uh, she went with the poems out the window. But it was to go out the doorway, out of the doorway of language, out of the doorway of language, which meant taking into account all that she uh, cares for in the origination, in the enactment, in the evolution, in the ways that they are heard, in the ways that they uh, come to our consciousness, to our conscious awareness. This is all part of the course 
of the inner energy of meaning of the words, which is that which she is attending to. So yes, you know, the viewings through the window, the entries and exits through the window, these are how she moves in terms of the poems. But as she puts it here, and this is a very good sentence, I hope you understand about poems. They are why I am telling this. Because as life, it reads all wrong, but as poems, all right. I hope you understand about poems because they are why I am telling you this. So it is the telling, you might say, that makes lower writing and, and all of us in some degree the custodian or the steward of the ongoing evolution of meaning, which is that which is being made clear to us in the mystery of language. Truth, in other words. And yet, at the same time, juxtaposed along with that in this world of time and space, there's all these mysterious and unknown things that languages, words, ideas, images, and associations are doing also. And it is those things, of course, that feed our delusions. Is that not true? And um, so all I can say, you know, is if you look out upon the world, you will hear them, the same words used by the demagogues and by the liars and by the truth tellers. Isn't it strange? They're all, they're all saying the same words. And yet the reality to which they are pointing and make, making clear is very, very different. And we take part in it in a very, very different way. And it is the poetry that when we understand the revelation of it, it is that which uplifts us and gives us a sense of growth or a sense of understanding the actual nature of reality. Whereas with the other forms of words used in circumscribed worldly terms, all we can be is persuaded or not persuaded. We can assent to it, say yes to it, or we can reject it and say no to it. A world of yes and no, a world of God and the devil, a world of all these dramas influenced by all these unknown things. And that's, you know, that's the way it's, that's the, that's, that's the nature of the forms of consciousness that work in this world. But all the time, there is the work of the truth tellers telling. There is the work of the poets making. There is the work of the seers, seers discerning. And then there is the work of, of all of us who are, you know, cultivating, cultivating, training, so to speak, arranging that in us which will make us worthy of the truth that we sometimes perceive, the truth that we know is out there, <laughs> and the truth that we know is in here also. And I guess we are doorways of ourselves because there are as many houses of language as there are individual souls. And all of those houses of language and individual souls, they all have their windows. They all have their doorways. They all have their entries and their exits and their in-betweens where you are neither one or the other. And each of these is somehow a reflection or a manifestation of an analogy, of an analog, of something like a wave that is going through all of the forms that we take and undergo and receive and deal with and, and create ourselves. And, um, and just that's the nature of the story of our consciousness, which these poems tell of in a very unique way. So that having been said, I must thank you for your heroic listening because the time has come for us to let these words go out into the world. So I thank you for your heroic listening. And God bless us.